So, hello, thank you for coming to the internal cycle of seminars today. Let's uh, have a talk uh, with Linus Bolter, and we're going to present a little part of his PhD. So, thank you, Linus, for collaborating with the seminars and um, with the talk. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about flow in with scarce data and um, geothermal energy. Well, geothermal energy uses grot, hot groundwater for generating heat and electricity. And the first question that you might ask is, what is the connection to Spain? Um, <laughs> because basically in Spain, there is not so much geothermal right now. Well, let's assess a bit why geothermal could be useful for Spain. Um, so this is the evolution of CO2, uh, CO2 um, emissions and uh, energy related between 2000 and 2018. There is a slight reduction, especially also in uh, electricity and heat generation. But if you, we want to reach net zero by 2050, well, maybe 2050 is here, um, <laughs> it should be much more negative. And especially in these three sectors, like electricity and heat generation, residential and service and other, uh, we have a higher um, share of heating and cooling, like heating and cooling energy that is um, that needs. We have to unmute ourselves, right? No, no. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in this. In these um, sectors, in these three, um, we have heating and cooling. And if we don't worry, this is the last diagram for today. Um, but just to compare the European countries. And so these are 14 European countries that participated in Heat Roadmap Europe and were assessed in there. And of course, in Northern Europe, like in Germany and France, we have a higher demand for heating and cooling. And, but even in Spain, we have a um, sufficient am uh, amount, actually, where it might be interesting that space cooling is the blue one. It's just a little a share here. Why the biggest is process heating, hot water, and space heating. And especially space heating and hot water could be used or could be supplied by geothermal. While process heating is usually the smelters of um, mineral processing or like iron ore processing, they need very hot temperature uh, and that we would not provide with geothermal. Well, to have a look where a local district heating would be needed or would be useful in Europe. Um, I first printed the Northern European map because of when we think of district heating, we first think of probably temperate climate or where it's cold in winters. And we see here, especially in this area or also in UK, Paris or Milan, there's high needs. But if we go to Southern Europe in Spain, and we have also uh, identified two centers, <laughs> Madrid or Barcelona, where the demand for um, energy is above a certain threshold, so that it could be useful to use district heating. Well, now to give it an even more local um, relationship, I also used uh, <laughs> the map for Mallorca. And even, so this project is a European project, um, and they plotted even for Mallorca, like in certain residential areas, and also, let's say, in Arenal, for example, where we have a lot of, where we have a lot of hotels, and district heating, um, might make sense, and even as for this is in the map, <laughs> and could make sense. So these maps show the demand where we could be useful to have district heating. Now we have to see where is geothermal um, applicable, and therefore I found this map. And so there's actually three temperature ranges or temperature scales that um, are considered. The first one is zero to thirty degrees, and you might wonder now what is the point. Um, but you could use um, this, like basically all of Spain, you could use for um, heat exchanging temperature. What means in summer when you cool your house, you you so these these heat pumps they have they, they are heating a certain medium like water, and you pump this water to the underground to heat the underground. And then in winter you can use the hot underground, pump the hot water bed, and heat your house. And this is basically possible all over all over Spain. Then we have the this kind of medium scale where. So geothermal power plants that produce maybe in this range, they can do district heating where one plant can heat, let's say, as for us. And uh, here we can see actually the contrast is a bit bad. 
but this is Spain. <laughs> and here we have several areas, especially I think in the plain just in front of the Pyrenees. Um, and here um, we have also potential. And now on the right map, this is the potential for generating electricity. For generating electricity, we need really high temperatures. Here they say above 150 degrees. And here, um, so these are just a very few spots in Spain, but the here's Barcelona. So for Barcelona, they have a high demand, and for them, it would be useful to use geothermal, even for um, producing electricity. So now that we clarified why Spain could think about geothermal, now let's talk about um, how does geothermal work. So the basic principle is that we send um, um, cold water, or let's say at a degrees of 20 uh, degrees Celsius, we send it down to the subsurface and use the fact that the vapor we get the hotter it gets also. This is the, you know, what we call geothermal gradient. So at four kilometers depth, which is already quite high, we reach, for example, 100 degrees. So we let the water flow through the rock, pump it back hot, use it either for uh, generating electricity, um, and then use the water at 60 degrees for district heating. This could be a setup for Barcelona um, with the mountains in the background. Um, <laughs> just imagine it. Um, otherwise, if we have colder temperatures, we just use it for district heating without the power plant. So now one major question is, how can water flow through rock? Um, and most of you might have imagined um, when you heard first of it that we have like a container down there where the water is stored or a cave, the water heats up and then we get it out there. But the pressure down there is so high that there is no big spaces um, like caves. But we have this, we have core space in rock, what means we have a, in, in, in limestone, like in Tamantana, we have little voids, little spaces where the water can flow through. So we have on the one hand pore space and we have fractures. So water can flow through both. And in this example, we had fractures um, where the water flows through. And just to give a context in our research group, um, from our research group here is um, Dario, Oregon, and Iman. They work mainly on this um, fracture, modeling water flow through fractures because it's more demanding and there's more research needed in this field. Well, to give you, um, what we define here is usually the rock permeability, which is one of the most important values for us. And it means how easily can water flow through this. Um, so here's the definition. And since this value will be now a very central part of the presentation, we prepared a little experiment, which is this one, uh, which we um, um, Dario, Victor, and um, Rodman presented at the Need the Lab. And we will show you now the effect of permeability on the water flow with this column. <laughs> so in three, we are pouring the water into, and we will see different effects of both colors. Okay. Three, two, one, go. And what we can see now, although the effect should be a bit more, a bit more clear, is that the water flew much easier through this one than through this one. What means this one has a higher probability value than this one which is because we have bigger grains here, this is gravel, and the pore space in between is also bigger. Um, while here we have smaller grains, it's more compact. Also the surface is higher of, because we have a lot of little rocks. Um, so the volume to surface ratio is um, more surface, so which is another effect. And so this is why the probability here is lower. <laughs> well, what I want to explain now is what does our research contribute to the development of geothermal? Because geothermal is a, is a very complex energy. And it's not like solar power where you, you buy your panel, you put it in your garden, maybe you pay an electrician to connect it, and then you're done. Um, but in, for a geothermal project, you have a lot of players that's, um, or a lot of steps to, to complete, complete such a project. So we start with geophysical exploration. Um, I don't know if you ever saw this kind of device. Um, maybe in my in my Europe, maybe it doesn't. In my village, when I was a child, there was one stage of passing, and they they have this kind of vibrating plate that they put in the ground, and then they they make um, um, seismics. What means they they send a seismic wave through the surface. The, the, surf, the wave travels somewhere, gets reflected at a certain layer of rock, and um, usually at the where is the contrast between rocks, like where you have um, one yeah one boundary, it gets reflected and comes back. And you interpret these waves, and by interpreting them, you try to find the different layers in your subsurface. 
this is the whole science itself. It's called geophysics, and you can do you you can do your PhD in this. So this is not what we do. We use their data, but it's um, what we want to get from it is without drilling, without expensive boreholes, getting already an idea of the subsurface. Well, once you your geophysicist forecasted there might be a, a geothermal reservoir, you start the exploration drilling. So this is an example in Germany in, in front of the Alps. Um, so the exploration drilling was four kilometers deep, and it's, it's already very costly. This one costed 60 million euros. So if you need to find investors for it, then you have to tell them it's, it's going to work, trust me. Um, <laughs> so once you, you drill down there, you create a tricky reservoir model. So actually now what I'm showing is all from the same project. Um, so you combine these kind of um, wave um, patterns that you interpreted, you combine with all information you got from your borehole. And this is then you create this fancy model. And now it's about uh, characterizing the reservoir. Char characterizing means which permeability uh, can we expect <laughs> from, from our reservoir, like how fast the water or how easily can the uh, water flow through. For this, we do a well testing, what means we pump water down there, we measure how much water flows per second, and we measure the pressure. So this is this is the data set. Maybe we don't have to understand it in detail. Um, but this is what this is what we have to work with. This is our data usually for such a big project. And I may just explain it a bit. Here we have the flow rate, and this is an injection if it's positive. So here they made the major injection test of 50 liter per second, and then you measure the pressure response. And from this pressure response, you try to infer, uh, infer the permeability. Like you try to understand, okay, what could be the uh, the permeability of the reservoir, and you use physical equations for this. So as a next step, what is important for the investors, you make a calculation for 20 years, how much hot water do you get? Like at which temperature, at which flow rate um, can you get for the next 20 years um, until your reservoir cools down? Because it can happen that, so the, um, the, the water flows from the injection call to the production. And if, if we call it a cooling front, if it migrates to here, um, then we, we don't produce anymore after 20 years. This can happen. So you need to do this kind of calculations. And once you convince your, your investors that even this looks well, then you complete your plant. I ah, hear we see even better. Then you complete your plant and you're producing um, like this wonderful picture in Iceland. So now to put our research in this big list, we are trying to improve by, uh, reservoir characterization because it has high uncertainties. We have only Usually we start with one borehole, so we just have one. And from this one borehole, we want to get information about the whole space down here. Just from these two graphs, like you have a, you have a pressure graph in blue, you have a flow rate graph in red, and that's it. And you have your geophysical map, um, which is just interpretation of side things. So this is where, where, we have, where we try to improve this to get to uh, reduce the uncertainty. So the objective of, of my research is to create reliable reservoir models with this very reduced amount of observation points. So if you make it more abstract, each well is one observation point and use machine learning for it. Machine learning might be more useful or like um, has some potential because right now we use uh, physics-based models that are deterministic. And with them, it's a bit hard to integrate these noisy measurements and especially to continuously in integrate them. So if you see now these measurements, this is between day two and day 15. So we are measuring 13 days. And it's uh, maybe in day, day three, you also already want to know something about your reservoir. So it would be great if every day you can plug the new measurements into your model. Well, this is right now not really possible with the numerical models um, that we use, but just the way they are, they are designed. And with machine learning, we are hoping that it's much more interesting to do like this continuous forecast, like with weather, for example. And so that we every day plug a little bit of the data into our model and get a forecast for the next um, for the next um, dates. So now we get more deeper to what I do actually, and to assess what machine learning can do, I created a synthetic data set, like an example reservoir, sandbox reservoir. We call it also. Um, just to assess what machine learning can do. So this is now a 25 meter strip. We don't have, it's like a bit bigger in this room. And we impose a pressure on the left side. We set the pressure at zero on the right side, and then we have a diffusion. Like this is just a, the physical process called diffusion. And 
what is a bit different in our reservoirs that we have a heterogeneous permeability. Um, what means in this we, we show even better. In the in the front we have a low permeability. This would be like this. And then in the center we have a higher permeability. Would be the bigger gravel, for example. And then we have low again. So what? Why do I do this? This is just an example data set, and I want to train or I want to test with my machine learning how many data points my machine learning needs to make um, to 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 infer the pressure, like to represent the whole pressure field. Because that's what we want at the end. We want, with a few observation points, we want to know the pressure field for the whole reservoir um, and match it with permeabilities. Okay, so now we use a first in the um, in, in this workflow, we use first a data driven neural network. Um, I think Marco already presented a bit on neural networks, and this is a very, very easy one. This is called just an RT crypto neural network, the most general one that exists. And how we have to imagine is. So our neural network outputs us a function of pressure. What means we give as input the uh, space and time. And for each point of space and time, we want uh, our neural network gives us a solution for pressure. So but the, in the initial state, when you do this, the, the solution that is proposed is just wrong. So um, the prediction is now red and the, um, the, the ground roof is blue. So. And, but you always uh, you always have a solution at least. And now you start to optimize the solution with the data. So you you train it with data. Here's our um, space dimension. Here's our time dimension. And we train our new network for random points in this domain. And what means for on every point we uh, we compute the difference between the, the our our observation and the output of the neural network. Um, and we do this for all the points. We we calculate the mean square error or any other error. Get a certain value. And then we start iterating because if our loss, like the value, the error value is called loss, if this is still high, we adjust our new network and we say do it again. <laughs> and so we let it do again a lot of times until we are happy with the result, until the error is minimized. So this is now the initialized neural network at epoch one. So each cycle is called epoch. And now we, we let it run. So the epochs increase. And you can see that by each epoch, it's minimizing the error. We are getting closer and closer to our solution. So this is now just explaining how does a data-driven neural network works. And after, yeah, here's already fine. We could stop the process now. I would, I would be happy um, with the after 80 epochs. But the problem is we used a lot of training data points here. So all the red point is a, is a data point of information. And as we, as we just know from some slide before, we don't have so many information in our space. And we have much less. And if I use a more realistic amount of, of, of training data points, so it means if this is our 25 meter space, if I inform the network about here, about the exact pressure here, here, and there, and there. So these are already five informations. Um, the regression is rather bad. And now we have five observation wells. What, what I call here five observation will. But in reality, we have even less. We have maybe in the beginning just one. And if you're lucky, two, um, but that's it. So we have to do something. We have to, as my title says, we have to bridge the information gap between this and this uh, information point. Um, so one solution that was proposed in 2017 and is developed since then is called um, physics based or physics informed machine learning, which is especially suitable in domains where we have just some data, not lots of data, because otherwise you could use data driven, and where we know some physics. Because down there, we might all, we also don't know exactly the permeability, and, and there's a lot of uncertainties in the space. So how does PIN work? Um, it's, very, it's very similar to the previous one. The only thing is we have less data. Um, so the rest is all the same, just we have less data, and we inform our new network about the exact solution only, here and the like this is the this is the space so in the beginning and at the end so here we get the data we also know that at time zero at time zero we, we assume the it's in balance there's nothing so we also know that and for all the rest we assume in this case it's the other extreme case we assume we don't know anything we don't have any observation and what we do in this space like for all these yellow points we calculate the residual of a physical equation what means in theory, if the, if, the, if the pressure is, or if the suggestion of the neural network is perfect, 
then r is zero. But in the beginning, it's not zero. And so we minimize, in this case, we minimize um, three different arrows. We minimize the data arrows and we minimize also this arrow um, for the, from the PDE, like from the partial differential equation. But this is just a diffusion equation. And that's a basic physics, physics and quantum neural networks. And now what we get now is a pin output, or like this is the regression that my that our physics and quantum neural network does. And the difference before is we just have two data points like here and there. And for all the rest, we just calculate physics. And we get a um, sufficient result. Well, now the, the clue is that we, we, we can calculate only physics, but we could now use more information points over space. So this kind of flexibility to use data, but also constraints or information, this is basically the big, the big uh, advantage of this method. It's a baby method, but means it's still very young. It's, um, usually it's just um, applied in, what, um, in sandbox examples, what we call like in very simple conditions. And we are trying right now, um, yeah, that's just what I said. And um, we're just trying to, right now to bring this little method into a large scale, like that we can really use it in the reservoir because this is not the reservoir yet. This is just a 25 meter strip, but to have a 3D complex, um, um, complex space, um, it's something else. So this is, this is the journey that I'm on right now. And secondly, what I'm also do, not doing yet, but which is, um, will, will be the goal to have this continuous forecasting. Um, because this would be extremely useful, especially if you have these several days measurements. And one question to discuss, and I think there might be some overlapping, is actually how, in case you don't have other questions, um, how to transfer this method maybe to your research. Because I know for sure in biology, you also have stars data. Everyone, start their data are always expensive. Um, you can Marco has a lot of data, he has images. Um, <laughs> But in some domains, like for us in the subsurface, every well, I told you one well, 60 million. So you don't really depend on them if you can just have two. Um, so in these cases, it's very useful to, um, to use data-driven methods, but also to constrain your problem with any information you have. And the good thing is you don't need, I mean, we have a PDE, like this partial differential equation, but maybe you know another relationship. Maybe you for your pollination, you know a relationship between the, the uh, between the flower and the bee. So you can put this relationship also in here. Instead of only putting the data, you can put some relationships and try that the model fits all of them. Yeah. This was my presentation. Um, thank you for your attention and uh, attention. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, you said at the beginning that you have some, you could use a deterministic model, but you, they don't use the data simulation, the one you were aware. So you have to, you have, so you go from machine learning, but are there some deterministic models that are working on data simulation or not at all? I think there are, but we are not, like we are using the finite element method and their data simulation, like continuously assimilating data, is, you know, that is, doesn't work so well. And usually also, when you, when you have a change of information, you have to run the model from the beginning. Like to have this, these batches of data put into the model and um, yeah, it doesn't work so well for at least what, what I know for our models um, for these kind of codes that we are using. Maybe in your field it works better because you use satellite data, no? I don't know, for the data simulation, maybe Massimo, I know that in SOSI they do data simulation with your models. If you see simple models of uh, your predict temperature, so 1D, and if you see that at that moment you have a, a bias, you're under one degree, there's a, just a bias adjustment. That's, that's how you can do easily a, a way of the assimilating data, just as super easy, but maybe it doesn't. Is it also finite elements that you use? No, no, no. <laughs> it, it... <laughs> okay, so people are working on this though. On data assimilation, yeah, but uh, with the um, physical models, and not much. Like an hour. I don't know if you can know more, but an hour from you, see, I would say not so much. Mm -hmm. um, um, first of all, nice to meet you. I just arrived yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm doing a PhD in Nevertheless, 
So that it's not like it, it, usually it's really tedious to find the perfect parameters to your case of study, and then you have to to adapt it to each case of study. And thanks to neural networks, we can learn with these parameters. So that's yeah. Actually, I don't have experience yet really on data simulation, but it's something that we can actually focus on also. Because I mean, like the, the nice thing is that the neural networks come from the data side, and now you can constrain them. With physics, but models that we use, they are they are they are calculating exact physics always, and it's so it comes from the other direction. And I don't know, we are not working in the development of these codes. They are big codes usually that run that are like whole institutes create their code and then reuse it. Just yeah. more simple question about this this plot you you should be poor in the other one the, the different iteration this you get it after how many iteration mm, this yeah it depends a lot for the maybe 1000 let's say it, this one the training of pin it takes longer than with direct data um and also i, I skipped the main challenges because i wanted to say something else <laughs> but like we have scaling when you just use data you can easier easier scale your data while when we use physics, you have to respect the, the dimensional relationships within the equation, which makes the scaling more complicated. And I didn't know this. I spent a lot of time on understanding why things don't work. And also this hyperparameter tuning that you also just mentioned with regard to data simulation. Um, so because the, the, these models, they have a lot of parameters maybe we hear, like inside this neural network, we have, we have certain parameters that we can change. For example, the amount of these uh, we call nodes or neurons per layer, this is one layer, and then you have several layers, then you have activation functions. This is inside. I mean, we're not getting into the details, but you can uh, you have to you can optimize or vary a lot, and depending on how you design this, it, it um, influences the result a lot. So there's a lot of um, um, yeah, how you say, things that you that you have to take into account, and that makes it not easy. Um, so this took me a very long time to understand and to make run. Yeah, but once it works, it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very under high development right now. Yeah, yeah. which uh, which data do you simulate? Only pressure? Pressure flow rate is all data. And not temperature? Because you have an, in the end, you have an exchange of temperature, right? And not, yes, that's and a very good question. Well, the pressure. So maybe you could use as well the temperature for. Your yeah, so right now, I have uh, since this is the, we started very simple, so we just solved one process, which is hydro like hydraulics. So the next step, which is a more um, dominant, um, I just go back here, uh, which is a dominant process of mechanics. And because, especially if your fracture flow, your fracture is opening, open, what means what changes the permeability of the fracture, so it is called hydromechanical coupling. So this would be one process that we could add. And what is interesting, there are data also for mechanics. If you do injection very big scale, you have a surface uplift, very slight surface uplift. Uh, <laughs> half the reservoir. Uh, centimeter um, scale. Huh? Yeah, or millimeters. Let's yeah, centimeter scale. <laughs> um, and so you can you could match this, for example. So and since and now there's also a new or what means new, but it's just stuff we about to be implemented that you have uh, fiber optics in your borehole. And they can show you the displacement of the borehole slightly. So this is also a data set that you can simulate. And there are ten, like the tendency is that you will have more and more data sets available or indirect data sets. Um, and with the machine learning, it might be easier to simulate all of them. And temperature would be the last one, um, <laughs> where I'm not yet, and I don't know. Probably in my PhD, it was over here. Right? <laughs> um, but like this is this is also from our group um, a model like. Um, uh, Iman you know, said he works also in our group and they made a hydraulic a thermal hydraulic model for example and for modeling this yeah okay. well, uh, the more you are the coupling the more you have to add uh, at least uh, one other equation balance equation basically so yeah, yeah it's it more complicated you have, yeah. you have more material parameters and, yeah 
but also more data. So, yeah. so now you have one equation. If you add the thermal part, you have an other equation. You have also not just what the equation, but also the relationship between the two equations, you know? So you can't complicate it, you know? Well, if there's no further questions, then let's have a beer. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Renewson.